is covering the spread. Part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have gotten to the part of the NFL calendar where some teams gearing up for a playoff run and some teams gearing up for the NFL draft already. And it's been an odd couple of days with a Raiders linebacker retiring after selling his Pokemon cards. We've had uh, Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro practicing Wednesday on IR Thursday. It's been a weird week. We're going to break down what that means for betting player props with JJ Zacharyson of LateRound.com getting his read on the player prop market for this week uh, for week number 10. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here as many Mentioned by JJ Zacharis and check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. His work is at LateRound.com and the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. And JJ, any Pokemon cards you've sold uh, yet, or are, is your being here an indication that those don't exist? I wish that I had my Pokemon cards from when I was growing up. And it's also wild that like Pokemon is still a thing. Like yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm firmly a millennial, like in terms yeah. of my age, like firmly, like right in the middle of being a millennial. And I collected Pokemon cards. I played Pokemon growing up and it's still going on. Like my daughter is going to be playing yeah. Pokemon too. Uh, it's just wild that that thing is just stuck around. But I, I wish I still had my cards because I'm yeah. sure that I could could at least buy a bigger house maybe. if I Sure, still yeah. Yeah, yeah. Blake Martinez, the linebacker for the Raiders. He played 91% of the snaps in week nine, sold the Pokemon card for like $700,000 on Tuesday and retired on Thursday. Like that is king stuff. Yeah, um, that really is. Like I I have like a, an Aaron Rodgers rookie, a couple of Aaron Rodgers rookie cards, but they're worth less than a thousand. So yeah. uh, and also Pokemon cards were banned at my school in elementary school. Yeah, same. Because like there were too many kids like getting like losing a lot of money basically and their parents yeah. got mad. So I I had one that I found in a book that is the only Pokemon card I've ever possessed because they Do were. Do you know which one it was? No, no idea. I lost it immediately. Probably a Weedle. You probably had a Weedle. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm going to assume you're probably correct though. But uh, missed opportunities and that's why we're here talking about player props week number 10. We'll break it all down and let you know where JJ has seen value for this week in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. We have our NFL Week 10 uh, spreads, money lines, and totals podcast up with Ryan Williams and also our College Football Week 11 podcast with Ed Fang. We also talk some World Cup with Ed on Wednesday as well. So get all those on the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. The Week 10 NFL Sunday Million on the DFS side is officially live on FanDuel. Showcase your NFL knowledge and construct your best nine-player roster while staying under the salary cap. Then follow along using FanDuel's live scoring feature to compete for your share of $1.4 million in cash prizes, including... $250,000 first place. The entry fee there, just $5. The lock for that is on Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So uh, get your lineups in. That's approaching quickly. Head to FanDuel.com and submit your lineups today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app for more details. Let's take a look now at week number 10. And I think the key thing that's sitting out to me, JJ, is the wonkiness in this Raiders-Colts game. Because it kind of seems like both teams might be tanking don't really know it's kind of weird um we have these guys who are sitting like hunter renfro we got darren waller now out as well the colts had the sam ellinger situation not sure on jonathan taylor motivation is is questionable i would say for both sides based on what they've been doing recently so that does open up volume but do you worry about the team's ability to move the football when they're suddenly missing impactful players for whatever reason that may be yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a concern. Like, if you're missing good players, you know, I think that this is one of the big battles and uh, arguments and uh, discussions that we've had in the fantasy football space for years now where, uh, you know, if a player leaves an offense, uh, is that necessary? And he's a good player. Is that necessarily good for other players in that offense? Because, yes, they will see more volume, but that offense then becomes less, less efficient. I think overall... Uh, you should always lead with volume, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about fantasy or whether you're talking about player props, what have you, that's, what's more important. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about one of those scenarios a little bit later, but um, you know, you're, you're going to be focused more on volume. You should be more focused more on volume above efficiency within this team because so much affects efficiency. It's not just one wide receiver 
or especially like a slot guy or something like that. It's not just one offensive lineman that can impact things. But what I generally do is it just goes back to how I sort of approach projections, which is a top down approach. And if the markets show that these teams aren't going to score as many points, and that's going to be reflected in my projections to begin with. So right. let's say that Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller are both out, which they are now. Uh, and the Raiders line doesn't move at all. And they still have the exact same team total. Well, all of a sudden a guy like Matt Collins, who is going to likely see a little bit higher of a target share now, even though he has been a full-time player, uh, a guy like Matt Collins is now in the same offense from an efficiency standpoint, because they're going to score the same number of points hypothetically. Um, but now he's just going to see more work. So now you can bump up Matt Collins. So I'm really looking at, at what the markets are doing there because I do take a top down approach. And the markets, I think do a pretty good job of accounting for this. Um, like they can kind of tell you, is this guy a needle mover who is out like with, with Jamar chase, you know, like you're yeah. going to bump a volume for T Higgins and stuff like that, but the offense might not be as dependable as it otherwise would be. Um, does this guy move the needle? Darren Waller has been out for a while. Hunter Renfro this year has not been playing like a needle mover. Right. So I think that it's kind of a case by case basis, but trusting the market like you're doing, I think is the proper way to lean on the insights of, very smart people who are betting into these markets. Yeah. Other thing that's important for this week, at least for me, is Justin Fields. We've seen him run a lot more recently. And I want to ask you about that because on a broad level, how quick are you to adjust a player's projected volume going forward following a spike? Because obviously, depends on the situation. You know, we have to make that caveat as always, but it could be variance. You know, maybe he just happened to run the past couple of weeks, or it could be a concerted effort by the team to make him more involved that way. So, from a broad perspective, what processes are you going through to decide if it's a tangible shift or just variance? Yeah, I mean, you have to look and see uh, if there's a reason for these things happening, right? Or, or if it is just variance. And there are some things. You know, instead of looking at pure rush attempts, let's say for Justin Fields, you can break down that rush attempt number and look at it. Uh, between scrambles mm -hmm. and between uh, designed runs. And if you look at what the Bears have done, not only have the Bears been a little bit more pass heavy, I know, I mean, they're still not pass heavy, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's still the most run heavy team that we've seen basically over the last 15 years, but uh, they have been more pass heavy over the last, you know, three or four weeks or so. Um, but the, the one thing that's really important here is that he, he averaged uh, eight design runs per game over his uh, last three. He's averaged eight design runs. Uh, that number was three and a half over his first six games. Wow. So he's basically dub more than doubled his designed runs over the last three games. And what have we seen? We've seen a Bears offense that's much more dynamic. We've seen Justin Fields be a lot more, not only viable in fantasy football, but just more productive in general uh, because they're doing things. They're, they're formulating this offense around Justin Fields' strengths. So when you can pinpoint to that thing, you know, you can say, oh, they're actually letting Justin Fields run because they want him to run, not because he's dropping back to pass and getting pressure because the offensive line is so bad, so he's running, um, you know, that's the difference here. You know, his, his rush attempts have increased just because there's more design runs, but what has increased more is the breakdown and the change in those rush attempts and what those actually look like, which is the design runs. So yeah. I do think when you can pinpoint something tangible like that, you know, it's, it's no different than like if we see in the Steelers offense, you know, Chase Claypool's gone, and I'll get to this in a second as well, but Chase Claypool's gone, and what's what's that going to look like from a from a target share perspective for a guy like George Pickens? Well, if George Pickens sees an increase in target share, uh, with with Ch there, there's a reason for it because Chase yeah. Claypool's gone. Like there's yeah. you can pinpoint that one thing. Otherwise, it's a likely noise. There's a lot of variance, but I do like when you can tell that story and put that narrative around why the data is saying what it's saying. Yeah, you're quantifying intent. And I think that's what you're doing with the, the Bears. You're quantifying their desire to make Fields more of a running quarterback, more of a threat that way. And it's obviously paying dividends. So if it weren't working, maybe you're skeptical. Maybe you think, OK, they could revert back based on this, but it's working. So I don't think we're going to see a reversion there. But if you can quantify intent in that way, I think that makes it a lot easier to trust. Let's talk about now about some fluid situations uh, for this week. We got a lot of them uh, that you could pick from. So uh, which fluid situations are you turning to to see if you can identify value once props for those situations are up? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few. One of them, uh, briefly, I could say, is, is the Tampa Bay backfield where we've seen, you know, I, I think that the narrative, though, around the Tampa Bay backfield is a little bit off because there's a lot of reports that have gone on this week saying, oh, Rashad White might take over this backfield towards the end of the year after what we saw this past week. You know, Leonard Fournette hasn't had, been as strong as a runner as Rashad White has this season, which is all factual, mm -hmm. but it wasn't last week that really triggered this. I mean, we've seen this happening throughout the season. I think I've talked about this situation in this in this portion of the show yeah. 
uh, historically where Rashad White has seen a 40% snap share in this offense uh, this season. I mean, last week was actually his fourth highest snap share of the season. It wasn't even that much different than what we've seen historically. So I do think that in situations like that, I, I try not to lean into the narrative as much. And I try to just look at what the data is saying instead, but that's at least one of the situations to monitor. Another one I just brought up, uh, Chase Claypool uh, being gone uh, in the Steelers offense. We didn't get to see the Steelers last week because they were on a bye. But but, Ch- but Claypool had 17% of Pittsburgh's targets this year, um, which is not insignificant. And so, you know, I know a lot of people talk about vacated targets and, you know, uh, you know, uh, basically fitting, uh, you know, if, if a guy has a raw volume or a raw target total, uh, basically taking that target total and sort of dispersing it around the offense. But there's a little bit, there's some flaws in doing that because offenses don't run the exact same week over week in terms of plays, run, pass rate, et cetera. What you really should be doing is looking at target share. And there is vacated target share. It's a very real thing because target share always adds up to 100%. Um, and so with 17% of that gone, that gets dispersed throughout the Pittsburgh offense. Deontay Johnson probably gets a bump. You know, Pat Fryermuth, he, Pat Fryermuth does have a tough matchup this week because New Orleans has been very good against tight ends, but he likely will get a bump. The one guy I'm most intrigued by, though, is George Pickens, who had a 14% and a 7.5% target share over his last two games. So that's not very strong. Now he's probably going to see a more significant bump than what you'll see from like a Deontay Johnson. And he's very talented, too. So that's one of the situations to definitely look at. Um, and then lastly is the Chiefs backfield. We've talked about the Chiefs backfield before on the show. Um, the last two games, so so we had that Rappaport report that came out that said that Isaiah Pacheco is going to be the starter, right? That was right. in week seven. And then they had the bye, and then they had week nine. In week seven, they played San Francisco, and in week nine, they played Tennessee. You saw last week, because it's more recent in our memory, you saw last week uh, Tennessee can stop the run really well, and Kansas City just abandoned the run completely in that game. Uh, and then they ended up, it ended up being a, a good thing at, at the end of the day. Um, and then against San Francisco, it's another good rush defense. So, you know, that rap sheet report report wasn't totally, totally wrong because right. number one, Isaiah Pacheco did start uh, in that game and he has been starting. And then number two, we did see a shift in backfield share uh, when, you know, since that report dropped where over the last two games, Clyde Edwards, Alaire has been number three in that backfield in terms of snap share. Uh, Isaiah Pacheco is playing ahead of CEH. And I'm very, very intrigued by Pacheco then in this game, because finally they have a matchup where they could run the ball hypothetically. Yeah. You know, they're nine point favorites. Jacksonville definitely can be run on much more than Tennessee and San Francisco. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people will see what they've done on the ground the last couple of weeks and be like, Oh, it's still a split. And it is a split backfield, but I don't, I, 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 I do think that Kansas city hypothetically wants to get the run game going to some degree. So I think Pacheco is really, really an interesting player to watch out for this week. I think everything they've done says they want to run when they can, because they are using pretty heavy personnel. There's a lot of Noah gray out. Even when Jody, Jody Fortson was out last week, there was still a lot of Noah gray out there. Uh, Mickey yep. had like a 40% snap rate last week. Uh, yeah, ran with a too. yeah. Yeah. The first drive as well. Pacheco played, I think nine out of 13 snaps. Like they yep. wanted to get him involved, but realized smartly um, I'm sure Andy Reid was delighted to be able to abandon the run. Um, they they couldn't run the football, so why bother? And it just shifted right. towards McKinnon with a huge snap rate. But like, I think I agree. Where if they can use Pacheco in that way, they probably will. And like, I think Jacksonville can keep this game decently close. But they are nine and a half point favorites in this game. I've not bet Jacksonville, so although I think they can keep it competitive, I'm not betting Jacksonville plus nine. That could be a positive script. A positive script in a friendly matchup is not something we've seen yet since this right. shift towards Pacheco. So I think those two factors combining do make him very interesting for this week. Let's talk about yardage props. What are you seeing there entering week number 10? Kind of a wonky week this week, I would say, uh, across the board of props. I'm not sure if it's because of the holiday or something like that, but uh, pretty limited offerings. What are you seeing as of now, though? Yeah, you know, I, there, there was one one that definitely stood out to me was Donovan Peoples-Jones. Uh, his, his line right now is 43 and a half. You can get that over on, on DraftKings. Um, I'm sure other books are offering a similar line, too. I'm, I'm liking the over there. Uh, the Dolphins have faced... Uh, your teams that face the Dolphins have seen above average pass rates this season uh, because Miami's good and teams will have to throw the ball against them a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, they have the fourth worst pass defense by success rate, according to number fires metrics. Uh, Peoples Jones has hit a target share of 20% in four of his last five games. And he's actually hit the over this 43 and a half number uh, in every single game since week three. So he's set up very, very well to, to hit the over here. Um, and, and it makes a lot of sense too, in a game where, you know, the, the slate this week is not super, super attractive in terms of just general matchups. And this one, 49 and a half point over under, 
um, you know, basically these Miami games are super fun in terms of, of scoring environments. So, um, you know, I, I do think that people's Jones makes a ton of sense. I mean, I love him in fantasy this week, but I think he makes a lot of sense too uh, in the prop markets. Um, Saquon Barkley is another one, you know, it's, I, I'm very hesitant to take the over on a line of 92 and a half rushing yards, but I think this makes sense logically. Um, it is a very high number. You know, you can get this in a lot of markets as well. Uh, the Texans have allowed this to happen though, in three straight games, you had Josh Jacobs crush this number. Uh, the Titans with, with Malik, uh, crush this number. I think it was the Malik game. Uh, and then, uh, Miles Sanders, uh, this past week, uh, got over this number as well. Um, Houston has allowed 104 more running back rushing yards this season than any other team in football. Um, and Saquon's median outcome, uh, has been 82 rushing yards this year. You know, I don't mm-hmm. want to use average there because it can be skewed right. by some of his big performances. Uh, he, he, his median outcome is an 82 yard rushing performance. And so, uh, in this matchup where you're facing the best matchup imaginable, the giants are at home. They're pretty big favorites in this game. Uh, 10 extra yards, 11 extra yards to get there. I don't think is that, uh, crazy to, to think. So uh, I think Saquon makes a lot of sense, uh, on the over there. I, you know, like I said, I am a little hesitant because it is a high number and I hate betting overs on high numbers like this, but it is just a smash spot for Saquon Barkley this week. Yeah, and I was curious about that one too. And um, this is this is a free ad, by the way. Uh, but Betscope, um, they uh, Colin Davies sent out this email yesterday for Betscope, and they have like this tool where you can plug in a projection. It'll show you like the distributions uh, based on that projection, so you can kind of see what the median would be, what expectations would be. Number fire right now is Saquon Barkley projected for ninety six point oh four rushing yards. If you put that into the Betscope um, distribution calculator. It would say that fair odds at 92 and a half would be minus 126. So as long as it's under minus 126, that's yeah. a good number to get him at. Um, yeah. So even though it's a big number, there's still value there based on the number of fire projections, at least, which I trust personally. Um, so it's a big number, but I think it's very fair. With the DPJ one, it's also important to note that I don't think David and Joku is going to play. He said that he yeah. will, but I think he he said that before their buy too. And there was no he's shot. Just, he's just a monster. He just he just wants to get out there and, and get going. But yeah, I mean, he hasn't practiced at least at the time yeah. of this recording. He hasn't practiced this week. And like, if they had the buy, he didn't. Once he didn't practice Wednesday, I was like, okay, he's not going to play. Um, so I think the DPJ one is one you want to get before injury reports come out Friday because I think that will go up. Uh, very good role for him in the one game without Njoku. As you said, good yardage upside. He gets deep balls. He has a twenty seven percent deep target share in games with Njoku. So taking Njoku out of the fold again, I think would be a very good thing for a DPJ as well. So I like both of those. I think they're both pretty fun. What about touchdown bets? Anything standing out to you there right now? Yeah, I mean, you know you know how I do it on this show. I, I like to, to throw fun. those crazy, crazy darts. But I'm going to actually, one of mine, I'm going to stick with DPJ. Uh, okay. Right now on BetMGM, you can get him at plus 280 as an anytime touchdown Sweet. scorer, uh, which I love because this season he hasn't found the end zone, um, and but he has over 400 receiving yards. You know, like I said, good matchup, uh, has seen really good target shares in the offense. Makes a lot of sense to go Donovan Peoples-Jones way at, at back with those kinds of odds. And then uh, also on BetMGM, another guy, another long shot, uh, Zay Jones is plus mm-hmm. 300 over there right now. Um, you know, they're, they're, uh, um, he, he's been playing as their number two wide receiver. Uh, he has a 19% target share on the season, uh, but he has just one touchdown this year, ex- despite an expected touchdown number uh, that's almost four. So he is a touchdown regression candidate. They're facing the Chiefs where they should be able to, or they should be forced to pass a little bit more. And when you get those environments where teams are passing more than they're running, you know, uh, touchdowns generally go that way. Pass rate does have some correlation to how teams are scoring touchdowns, whether it's through the air or on the ground. So I think in a pass friendly script, for this Jags offense, I think Zay Jones makes sense at plus 300. Yeah, uh, with the DPJ one, he has a 15% target sharing games with Njoku. So again, taking Njoku out should benefit him there. Um, Zay Jones has a 24% red zone share in games he has played with Marvin Jones. 24% red zone share for a receiver is very good, yeah. um, especially for plus 300 odds to score a touchdown. I'm hoping that you're right on both these because we did our DFS show yesterday and both DPJ and Zay Jones were loves uh, nice. for me in the receiver section. So uh, we can both be very happy if those wind up coming to fruition on yeah. Sunday. 
All right, that's all we got here for week number 10, uh, both of the player props and the traditional markets. It should be an interesting week, uh, kind of a weird one for sure. We'll see how things play out. Once again, do not forget to subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We also have all of our previous podcasts up on the FanDuel YouTube page. Check those out there and get Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. JJ, appreciate you as always. Good luck to you in week 10. We'll talk to you once again next week. Thanks, Jim. You can find JJ on Twitter at late round QB. Check out his work at late round.com and also check out the late round fantasy football podcast. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. Good luck to all of you in week 10. We'll talk to you once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network. 